Let's talk today about rendering your SketchUp models. And probably the first thing we should discuss is what is rendering? Well, rendering is a term, an architectural term, that basically means coloring in. However, when you talk about rendering computer models, we mean basically taking the geometry that you have created in SketchUp or any other program, any 3D modeling program, and taking the materials, the textures and colors that you've applied, and making them look much more photorealistic. And the way that this works is it, it takes those either colors or image-based patterns and kind of applies them in a very precise manner, much more detailed than we tend to see in our just normal day-to-day -day SketchUp use. It also will create lighting that kind of bounces around in your space. And that also makes things look much more realistic because they're sort of based in physical reality. So the first thing we need to do is get a renderer. SketchUp doesn't have one uh, kind of natively. So one that we have been using recently is called Enscape. And if you go to our pages section of Canvas, what you'll see is there's a link down here under SketchUp and related things to Enscape. Just click on that and it will open up a new tab. You can download this right onto your own computer. Couple of caveats. Uh, one, the biggest one, is going to be that it only works on Windows. So you Mac users, you can either use the desktop computers that are available in the classroom, and you can just email yourself or use Dropbox or Google Drive to send your SketchUp file to yourself and work on it on the desktop. You can also install what's called Boot Camp. Boot Camp allows you to run Windows on your machine. And if you install Boot Camp, install Windows, you can then install SketchUp. And your free student license, I believe, does give you two installations of SketchUp. So you can have one running on the PC side of your computer and one on the Mac side. And if you run Boot Camp, which is different than something called Parallels, Parallels runs alongside the Mac programs on your computer. This will require actually restarting your computer. Anyway, with any luck, it will run on your computer. Enscape, I will warn you, is a little picky on its graphics cards. So some computers, either older computers or computers that just aren't using Enscape's favorite graphics cards, it will have some crashiness to it. Either way, sign up, uh, plugging in your information. We're gonna be using uh, Enscape with Revit and SketchUp. So you can check both of those off. And sooner or later, you're going to need ins to install Windows anyway if you're a Mac user, because we do use Revit in our department. So you'll have to get used to it. But if you install Boot Camp first, that makes life easier when you go later on to install Parallels, uh, which makes it easier using Revit. Anyway, I've already got it on my computer. So here we are in SketchUp and First of all, you can see that I have gussied up my model a little bit. I've added some fun things, finished putting in doors on my exterior kind of curtain wall, added a whole bunch of lighting that wasn't there before, some downlighting, some lighting on the tabletops, even some lighting, both downlights on the countertop and also uh, decorative lighting over the service area. Just having a little fun with my project. So you might say, where is Enscape? Well, Enscape is hidden. Uh, it's a menu, like we've seen other uh, kind of toolbars. Just right click on a blank area of your toolbar and you should see two Enscape menus, two for the price of one. You should get one that's Enscape and then Enscape capturing, which we'll get to in a later lecture. So I'll just call up the Enscape menu. The initial Enscape tool that you're gonna be worrying about is Start Enscape. And I'll just click on Start Enscape and it takes about a I don't know, 30 seconds or so. And what I'm gonna do here, I'm going to make my uh, computer show you kind of a split screen. If you drag your window up to the upper right corner, you'll see a little kind of, I don't know, ripple. If you drag it down a little bit from that ripple, what it will do is it will make your window that you were dragging kind of cover half the screen. And then you can click on the other window and it will make that fill the other half of this of the screen. This view here on the right is the same view as what we're looking at here. You'll notice, first of all, that there are some navigation keys. Now, I am not super familiar with video games, 
but my son, who is, tells me that these are common for PC, you know, Windows computer-based video games. WASD are the keys. Uh, I'm going to use the arrow keys here just for a second. What you'll see is that if you use those keys, in combination with clicking and dragging the left button, you can navigate your space pretty well. Now, if you're finding that it's too small a window, you can come in here and maximize the window, but I'm going to just leave them as kind of side by side because I have a couple of things that I want to show you how to do. I can also, as mentioned, click and drag with the left button, but I can scroll and that allows me to kind of zoom in on things a little more in a manner which is more familiar to the SketchUp interface. I can also hide that menu. If you look here, there are some uh, keyboard shortcuts that tell you how to hide the instructions. H will do that. You can also tap M to show you a little map. And you see here, it shows you where you are in the project. And as you look around, the map will indicate it. You can even make the map a little bigger. This is handy for larger projects uh, where you might get lost and you have no idea where you are. I'm going to hide that map also. So there we go. That's the basic interface. Now, the first uh, trick that you can do with Enscape, if you hold down the Shift key and drag the right button, and if I look here on my keyboard shortcuts, it shows me that, it will change the time of day. Now, this is awfully handy in a space like ours that has a lot of glass, and I can drag this and make it, say, early morning. See how the sun becomes kind of more, I don't know, dawn-like. Very pretty color to the light. If I drag it too far, it becomes nighttime, and now we can't see anything. So, and the reason we can't see anything, we don't have any electric lighting turned on in our project yet, so don't do that. You might say, well, whoop de doo this is not all that exciting. Well, first of all, one thing to notice is that the resolution of your screen is going to be a little low, and the reason is that what Enscape does is it, it kind of makes it go faster by doing a lower resolution. However, when you export the image, you'll see that it comes in as a higher resolution. So don't get worried if it's looking a little dotty. Some PC screens are better than others, so you might see more or less kind of drama there. Now, let's talk a little bit about making materials in Enscape. Now, Enscape respects all the SketchUp materials. You can see here that I have colors and I also have texture-based materials. Some are inside components, some are outside components. How do we change those? Well, if you go to your SketchUp menu here, and first of all, before I start fiddling around, notice that there's this Synchronize Views button here. If I click that, when I manipulate my SketchUp view, the two of them change. I think I'm not going to do that. I think I'm going to turn that off because I want to be able to navigate my SketchUp window independently because I'm going to be fiddling around with materials. All right, and that, that's fine. For example, I'm going to look at this bottle material. I'm going to use my arrow keys and click and drag my scroll or my uh, left mouse button to take a look at this bottle, but I still want to be able to edit it here in SketchUp in a way that's independent. All right, so here I am in SketchUp. The way that you change the materials of this model, well, first of all, if I just use the eyedropper tool in my materials palette, I can just slurp up that uh, material. And if I go to edit, I can change the opacity right here. And the Enscape will immediately reflect that change. You see how the wine bottle changes almost immediately when I do that. Let me zoom in on it a little bit. So you'll want to find a color that, or a transparency that you like. However, Enscape also has a nice way to handle these materials with greater detail. So for example, let's say I want to make this bottle frosted. I can go up here to this Enscape materials menu. I'll just click on that. First of all, it just assumes it's a generic material, which is fine. We can change the transparency here in this menu, make it more or less opaque. And then you'll see that there's other things we can do. We can tint the glass. All right, so we have more advanced colors. You're basically mixing colors here. And you can see this uh, color now ends up being, I don't know, more of a sepia. Very nice. But then there's even a button for frosted glass. 
and it's a little hard to see. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit on my material here. But if you check on that, you'll see that the, the glass looks a little bit more frosty. Then there's other things that you can do. You can have completely, you can have completely reflective reflections. <laughs> if they're not, that's a funny way to put it, if they're not so rough. But if you make them rougher, you see how the reflections get softer. That would be typical of frosted glass. So I'll turn that on. You can also have it be more or less specular, which is to say fully reflective, as opposed to the roughness, slightly different settings. So there we go. I have a very nice um, glass bottle. By the way, if you uh, tap the space bar, what you'll find is normally I can fly through walls, I can fly through furniture. If you tap the space bar, you go into what's called walk mode, and that will force you to not be able to fly through walls and doors. Not everybody likes that. And what I'm using, I'm using fly mode, and that allows me to get down low here so that I can see some of these materials that I want to show you. So what do I want to show you? Well, next silly trick that we can do, I'm going to go back to the select button here in my SketchUp materials, click select, and I'm going to grab this material that is painted onto my signage here. And once again, it's a material which is very easily modified here in SketchUp, but I'm going to go and I'm going to make some Enscape changes. This time I'm going to make it glow. And that effect is called self-illumination. And oh, look at that. It's now glowing. Okay, it's a light fixture. Now that's a little bright. You can see I'm getting what's called a lens flare here. I'm going to drag it down so it just glows a little bit. First of all, this is a great way to create some signage for your project. But what you'll find is it can be sometimes difficult as you add in lighting. Enscape will try to adjust the exposure. So I'm not going to fiddle with the brightness too much here, but I know that 16 candela per meter squared is, is about right for a sign. You can also change the color of the light coming out of it. Now when Enscape makes a, a glowing material, that glow, and I'll just drag this luminance up here a little bit, the glow can have a color. You see how the color is now kind of, I don't know, salmon or something like that. So be aware of that, that when you take a colored material and add some lighting to it, it will have that unusual effect of creating a kind of weird color. Even now, I can see a little bit of a salmon color on this wall. Other things that you can do uh, besides glowing materials, I'm going to come back here, use my select tool. I'm going to grab the wood material. And wood has an unusual characteristic in that it can be bumpy. And bumpy is a feature that you can add in Enscape, and it's actually called bump. And it, the simplest way to add bump is to just use the albedo. The albedo is kind of the brightness and darkness of the image file that is based on, that you use to base this material. So if I do that, it's a little hard to see the change. And what you can see as we add or subtract bumpiness, it's trying to make the wood look a little bit thicker, okay? A little bit less, I don't know, smoothly planed. Also, you can drag the bump you can have it go out or you can have it go in. And most materials will look better one way or the other. So it's just worth kind of fiddling around with these settings. I think that one looks a little better, but I don't want it too much because I think that would be kind of a, I don't know, a splinter hazard. So using the albedo is a great way to kind of get some additional characteristics to the material. I could use it for the texture as well. And you can see up here what it does is it kind of gives it a roughness map, they call this. A map is an image-based texture. I'm going to use my eyedropper here to soak up the tile material. So now I've got the tile material. Go back to Enscape. And we'll learn a new feature, which is that you can change the name of the material, and it will have an effect. I'm going to call it ceramic. And what you'll see is immediately the material becomes very glossy. Now this is a cool trick that Enscape does where it uses certain keywords to modify characteristics of the material. When I gave it the name ceramic, it changed a couple of things, but the biggest one that it changed is the reflectivity. So let's go take a look at those keywords. So there are a couple of keywords as mentioned, uh, water, 
is one of the simplest ones. Again, you just change the name of the material in SketchUp and it becomes watery. Other ones that I really like are grass, and it's really cool when you change those materials. Glass is another one, and you'll find that some SketchUp materials already have these names in them. It's just a matter of finding the ones that don't have it and changing what they look like. So let's go change a couple of these other materials, see what we end up with. Just for the fun of it, let's make the flooring grass instead of ceramic. Just come in here and type in grass, and like magic, you can see that it grows grass. And if I go back to SketchUp and look at the Enscape settings, you'll see that you can actually change the height of the grass. Now, this is one way that you can kind of get a shaggy carpet. So the one trick you really do need to remember is that in SketchUp, don't have the same material painted kind of everywhere in your project, or you will run into the situation where you, you get glowing materials where you don't want them. Anyway, back here in SketchUp, I have made the floor back to tile, uh, ceramic. However, what you'll see is that that's a little slippery. We can just add in some roughness to it. And one trick, if you're experimenting with these things, is to have the image disappear and just by using image fade. And you'll see that it's, it's super glossy and you can make it even more glossy like a mirror by dragging up the specular setting or drag it down so that it's not so reflective and maybe a little rough, kind of like you would expect in a floor. And now I'll drag the image back in and you can see that it, that looks a little bit more realistic. You can also use the albedo for texture if you want. See if that works better. I don't think it does, so I'm going to use the waste bucket here to throw out that, or that albedo based texture, but maybe a bump map will work. Let's try that. Oh, and that does work nicely. You can see how the grout lines look a little bit nicer. You can drag this up so that the bump sticks out, or you can drag it the other way and see if it looks better the other way. I think it looked better the first way, so we'll leave it over there. What other fun tricks can you do with your materials? Well, I'll show you one that is kind of handy here in SketchUp. But what I can do, I'm going to slurp up that material. It's just a kind of bisque colored material. Let me go in and synchronize my views briefly so that I can see the material. You can see the, the synchronization is not 100% perfect, of course. All right, let's unsynchronize them so that I don't have to go back and forth. So when I have this material, I can go to the materials menu and you can add a map for transparency. And what this means is I can sort of normally just drag the transparency and it applies it evenly. However, if I use a map, a texture map for that transparency, and that's basically an image file, and I'm going to go to my desktop here, find an image file that I was using. You can see that you can make transparency either 100% wherever the image is and 0% wherever the image is clear. And you might say, how did I get an image like that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It's just like when we created a custom image, you go to some search engine, Bing is the one I'm using here, and search for images. Make sure you use the word seamless. That's a good word to use. And then just find an image that you think you like. I, I like this one. I used the modifier PNG. And the reason I did that is typically PNGs, if there is white, in the image, the white actually becomes invisible. It has a special feature called an alpha channel, and that is really handy. I opened it up here, and on Windows, the alpha channel, when it's uh, transparent, appears completely dark. I can also go and edit the image itself, and there's a couple of transformations that I can have. For example, it's, I'm not sure why it has this image size here, who knows what Enscape is thinking. I can change the width and height. These are, what are these, meters? Okay, that's not as helpful for us here in the US, but that's fine. Anyway, you can see that there's a little bit of faceting based on the curves of this particular lampshade, but that's actually pretty smooth. That's a bigger pattern than I like. So let's go with something like 0.2. And there you go, you have a much more meshy sort of appearance. You can also invert the image 
But in this case, if you do that, the black becomes white and it doesn't have the same effect. So I'll leave it as is. Come in and take a look at your materials of your fabrics. Just slurp up the material and check, <clears throat> check them in Enscape. And you can use a bump map that's the albedo. It doesn't make it look super fab fabricy, but it does make it look a little fabricy. And this is a great way just to add a little more detail, just like we did with the wood. So I would strongly recommend whatever materials in your project are, if you've got marble or you've got granite, use these ready-made modifiers in the material name. Again, just type it in and you can get some interesting effects. So one last thing we need to worry about with these initial settings is kind of overall graphical appearance of the image. For that, we need to go to the Enscape settings menu. And there are a number of things that you can change in your view to just kind of gussy up the image a little bit. Now, the topmost one here, the one that comes up on the initial tab, the general tab, are outlines. You can drag that over and you see how lines start to appear. And some people like that look, some people don't. I'll drag it way up so you get a really thick line. Sometimes you'll look at it and you'll have just a lot of lines in a very complicated object. That doesn't look so good. However, when you have things like the ceiling where the entire ceiling is painted white, just a touch of line work really helps to see that definition. There are also modes. Some people like this white mode. I'll just turn that on and everything becomes pretty much white except for the exterior. Obviously this has emphasized the reflection outside of the window a little bit, but that's kind of a neat mode, neat way to look at it. There's also a polystyrol mode, which for interiors ends up being really pretty similar, but there's also a light view, which we will learn about next. Other things you can do, architectural two point perspective is a good one. Now in this particular view, I don't have a lot of perspective distortion, but if I was looking up at a very steep angle, the vertical lines are going to be all going to a vanishing point. This is essentially a three point perspective. If I check the architectural two point perspective, oops, and you have to unsynchronize the views so that you do that because it's synchronizing with the SketchUp view. Now you can really see how dramatic it is. If I just check architectural two point, all those vertical lines are now parallel to each other. I'll just uncheck that and see the difference real quickly. There are a number of other uh, features that you can add. I'll leave that on because I like it. Uh, one that I happen to like, but not everybody likes. In big spaces, you, you can have what's called depth of field, which is to say you can actually blur things in the distance. I'll make that extra blurry so you can see it. And then you can uncheck autofocus. And what that allows you to do, the computer will guess where you want to focus. But let's say you want the focus to be right here on these two people talking. You can drag that along and the white indicator in the Enscape window will show you where the focal point is going to be. I'll turn that off so that it's not irritating. There are other things you can do. You can change the field of view. If you're doing something like a drawing of a bathroom, which is a very small room, you need a pretty wide field of view. Rendering quality is one which the default value is high and that usually works pretty well. You can drag this down to draft view. What you'll see is that the lighting and materials are much less sophisticated. If you drag it all the way up to ultra, you'll see that it actually takes a little bit of time for the view to regenerate. Every time I move, there's kind of a hesitancy, even on this fancy computer that I'm using here. So leaving that at high is fine. Now there are a couple other fun things that you can do. If you go to the image menu, you can change the contrast. You can change the saturation if you want it to be more of a black and white view. I tend to think these are actually kind of nice. The SketchUp colors are a little bold. See how much nicer these tablecloths are now that I've desaturated them. But you can move it back or just reset this tab, reset it. Another one, again, that I like, but not everyone else does, is this thing called Bloom. This tends to make light sources kind of a little, I don't know, glowy and hazy. Not everybody likes that one. Ambient brightness is another one you can adjust. It doesn't have a huge effect without any electric lighting. Lens flare is one when you go and you look at the sun or other bright light sources, you'll get kind of a, a kind of a spotty effect. 
and vignette is one where it will darken the perimeter of the screen. I usually leave that kind of off, and I don't know what chromatic aberration is. Another fun one that you can play with is how cloudy the sky is. So you can change the density of the clouds, and you'll see real time that the amount of clouds actually kind of disappears as they go away. So if we drag that way down or drag it way up, the, the sky gets really dark. Wouldn't that be nice if we could do that in real life? Another fun one that you can do is, right now my project is kind of out in outer space here. It's just in the middle of a, bl a blasted out environment. You can change the preset from the horizon to have other ready-made kind of things. I can add in a forest. And what's cool is the forest actually moves when you look around. If you don't like where the forest is, you can, you can kind of rotate it, which is kind of, I don't know, I, I find that really funny. There's a number of ready-made ones. Again, you can adjust what you're looking at to be appropriate. Some people like the white cubes one, which is just kind of this vast landscape of, I don't know, white cubes. Very abstract. You can even load in what's called a skybox file. Now this is a little more tricky because there aren't that many available. There are a number of skyboxes that I have posted to Canvas that you can use. A lot of these are kind of hard to understand what they are, but they can be very interesting. For example, if you use, oh, I don't know, a uh, here, we'll use a hangar, which is a where you store your airplanes. And what you'll see is we are now inside a hangar, <laughs> which uh, is kind of an, an odd thing to be inside of. But uh, anyway, it does illustrate the point pretty well. These can be tricky because they do affect the lighting uh, quite a bit. It depends which one you use. There's one that's a beach that can affect that. But So your mission for this stage of using rendering is to call up Enscape, take a look at your model in Enscape, and see what the file looks like. And then if you have materials that you want to edit, which you almost certainly do, start changing the names of materials to get some basic effects. Things like tile or car paint are really quick ways or glass to make things look the way you intend. And then when you've created your view that you like, maximize the Enscape window. And when you do that, by the way, you'll see that the perspective changes slightly. The field of view is the same, but it, it tries to fill your screen. You can type shift or hold down shift and tap F11, and that will save a picture of your screen onto your computer.